Hi, let's talk about the common carotid artery and its branches. In this video, we'll discuss the major branches of the common internal and external carotid arteries, as well as some of the major elements of cerebral and cerebellar circulation. So the common carotid artery on the right side arises from the brachiocephalic trunk, and on the left side arises as a direct branch of the arch of the aorta. It ascends the neck bound within a condensation of the deep cervical fascia called the carotid sheath. And within that carotid sheath, we have the common carotid artery, as well as the internal jugular vein, as well as what we can't see here, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, and sometimes bound within the sheath is going to be ansa cervicalis from the cervical plexus. Now the common carotid artery will bifurcate into the external and internal carotid. This bifurcation can be quite variable. The external carotid artery is more anterior. The internal carotid artery is more posterior. That external carotid artery is going to supply the neck, the face, and the scalp with blood, whereas the internal carotid artery has no branches in the neck. It ascends up through the carotid canal of the temporal bone to service the contents of the cranial cavity, and it will also serve the orbit and a portion of the brow from the orbit. So here is the external carotid artery. So in the cadaveric image here, this is a posterior view. The vertebral column has been segmented and reflected out of the way. And we can see that bifurcation of the common carotid into the external and the internal carotid. You have a nice carotid sinus here. We uh, don't have a carotid body to see at this point, but those are the uh, Bayro and chemo receptors, respectively, for uh, blood flow to the brain. We can see a massive amount of ramification of the external carotid here, going every which way. Without precisely seeing the targets, many of these would be very difficult to identify on their own. So. Let's turn our attention to the illustration and discuss these branches. So first of all, um, this is a very stylistic um, illustration. This muscle here, the sternocleidomastoid, would overlie the, uh, the carotid sheath and its contents, but here it's illustrated as behind it. So we can see here's the bifurcation of common carotid. Here's external carotid here. And its first major branch is the superior thyroid artery. That superior thyroid artery is going to supply the thyroid with blood, as well as the, uh, the superior portion of the larynx with blood. The next branch is the lingual artery, going out into the sublingual space to supply the tongue and surrounding structures with blood. And then a very close branch, oftentimes sharing a common trunk with the lingual artery, we have the facial artery. That facial artery tends to jump into the face right about here at the pre-masseteric notch, and it's going to supply the, uh, the face with blood. We also have ascending pharyngeal artery. The ascending pharyngeal artery supplies the pharynx with blood, in particular the middle and inferior pharyngeal constrictors and stylopharyngeus. Then we have another posteriorly oriented branch here, the occipital artery. The occipital artery is going to supply the posterior aspect of the scalp with blood. It also sends some branches to SCM, sternocleidomastoid, and can supply uh, parts of the posterior most suprahyoid muscles with blood. There's also a posterior auricular 
artery, that posterior auricular artery, uh, is going to serve the auricle with blood, uh, at least the posterior aspect of it, and serve portions of the posterior scalp just behind the auricle of the ear with blood. And then we have the two terminal branches of the external carotid. There's the maxillary artery. The maxillary artery serves the deep face with blood. So that's running through the infratemporal fossa. And the superficial temporal artery, the superficial temporal artery serves the lion's share of the scalp with blood. It can also send an accessory facial artery to supply the face with blood as well. Next, we have the internal carotid artery. That internal carotid artery does nothing in the neck. It ascends straight up to the base of cranium where it's going to enter the cranium through the carotid canal of the temporal bone. So it's going to jog for a little while. It will pop up on either side of the cella tercica. And its first branch moving anteriorly is the ophthalmic artery. That ophthalmic artery is going to supply the orbit in the eye and the forehead with blood. That's running through the optic canal of the sphenoid bone. And then the remainder of the internal carotid artery is going to bifurcate into two major branches. There's an anterior cerebral artery and a middle cerebral artery to supply the anterior portions and the middle portions of the cerebrum with blood. Now we can see probably best here that between the anterior cerebral arteries, there can be an anterior communicating artery, as we can see the, the branch here. So this is a branch that, when present, is an open anastomosis between the internal carotid arteries on the contralateral sides. This is a tremendous opportunity to share the supply of blood to the, uh, the brain. Coming off of the anterior, uh, uh, off of the internal carotid artery sometimes is a posterior communicating branch. We can see that going this way, or the posterior communicating artery. It, uh, it may be present, it may not be present. Uh, it's not guaranteed to be bilaterally present if it's on one side, it may not be on the other. And if it is present, it is going to anastomose with the posterior cerebral artery, which is the terminal branch of the vertebral arteries. So as we look down here, we can see that the vertebral arteries, and you may remember these as arising from the first part of the subclavian arteries. They are traveling through the transverse foramina of cervical vertebrae 6 through 1, and then they come through foramen magnum. When they come through foramen magnum, they are going to give off very cutely named pica, which stands for posterior inferior cerebellar arteries, to supply the posterior aspect of the cerebellum with blood. And from pica, we have posterior spinal arteries, one on either side. And as the vertebral arteries continue to ascend, they're going to give off branches that coalesce into an anterior spinal artery. So just one anteriorly. And then they continue to ascend and they're going to come together to coalesce into the basilar artery. From the basilar artery, we'll have ica, which is the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, coming off on either side to supply the cerebellum with blood. And then the basilar continues. It will branch into the superior cerebellar arteries and then the posterior cerebral arteries. And a very important classical anatomical relationship between these two arteries will run cranial nerve three, the oculomotor nerve. 
So if there is an issue with an aneurysm here that can impinge on cranial nerve 3, leading to issues of movements of the eyes. So here is a cadaveric view of this in totality. We refer to it as the cerebral arterial circle of Willis when it's completely intact here. Um, only about 20% of individuals contain a, an intact, meaning a 360 degree uh, circle of Willis. So here we see the internal carotid arteries. There are the middle cerebral arteries the anterior cerebral arteries. We can see a, an anterior communicating artery there. And then coming back posteriorly, those are the posterior communicating branches. That's impressive that it's there. Happy about that. Ascending up, here's the vertebral arteries, and we notice that the right one is larger than the left one. There's pica on one side, pica on the other. I'm not seeing the, the posterior spinals. They're arising posterior to the spine. We can see the anterior spinal there. And then we have the basilar artery ascending. Um, there's ica coming off of the basilar artery. And as the basilar artery continues, we have the posterior cerebellar and then the posterior cerebral artery. And if you look close between the two here, we can see the third cranial nerve oculomotor. So that is the cerebral arterial circle of Willis. It is an impressive bit of arterial plumbing we have. And that leads us to the assessment question, which is, which branch of the internal carotid artery, if present, would confer significant collateral blood flow to areas of the cerebrum? Would it be the anterior cerebral artery, the basilar artery, the middle cerebral artery, the ophthalmic artery, or the posterior communicating artery? Well, the basilar artery isn't of, oh, sorry, uh, anterior cerebral artery, um, that's uh, a typical branch of the internal carotid artery. The basilar artery is a typical uh, coalescence of the vertebral arteries. Middle cerebral artery, again, another typical branch of uh, internal carotid. Ophthalmic, another typical branch, but this is serving the eye and the orbit. Uh, the, the only good answer here is the posterior communicating artery because this is going to connect blood flow from the internal carotid artery to blood flow from the vertebral artery. So two very separate sources of blood, one from internal carotid, the other from vertebral, which is coming from the subclavian artery. Thank you very much for your time.